Welcome to Fair Use. In 1972, a crack commando unit was sent to prison by a military court for a crime they didn't commit. These men promptly escaped from a maximum security stockade to the Los Angeles underground. Today, still wanted by the government, they survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the AT. So, welcome to Copyright and Fair Use. Uh, for those of you who are wondering why there was just a clip of the A-Team, uh, it's really for two reasons. Uh, first, you'll see it'll play into something we'll talk about later, but I think second and far more important, because it's just awesome. And <laughs> as, as we mentioned, we get to have the most fun up here, and hopefully you'll have fun along with us. So, uh, uh, we were already introduced, and uh, as, as you'll see, we actually match really well with our with our pictures, so you'll have no trouble finding us later. <laughs> uh, before we dive into anything else, we do have to do the disclaimer. This is an informational presentation. Our being up here, our answering questions does not form an attorney-client uh, relationship. We are not going to be giving you legal advice as part of this. If you do have questions, certainly feel free to ask them. If we can ask them, we're happy to try. If you have particular questions about your particular situation, about a particular legal issue you're facing, we encourage you to contact an actual lawyer and uh, uh, ask that question to them. Uh, from some of the people who were talking uh, earlier and asking questions, sounds like there are a number also in the audience and uh, plenty in the neighborhood. We've also attempted, as a Alex indicated very clearly, law is dynamic, things evolve, things change. We've tried to keep this presentation up to date, but things could change tomorrow, so you should also check and ask an attorney to make sure Nothing has moved from when we spoke. So, legal minutia out of the way, we can actually dive in right now. So, uh, we're going to be covering a few specific topics. Uh, so, Alex has provided uh, background on copyright. So, my job right now will just be really quickly flipping through this part of the presentation and uh, just highlighting one or two points that'll uh, play into what we'll be talking about uh, as we're going through. Then uh, we'll speak to the exceptions. This is copyright and fair use is the presentation title. Everyone jumps to fair use. Fair use is the sexy one. Yes, it's the first one in the statute. You will see it is probably not the one you want to rely on. If anything else can help you, you'll do that instead. And then when all of that fails, then you'll be left in the fair use category. And, well, we'll talk about fair use. We'll give you some of the background of fair use, fair use analysis, and we have a couple of examples. And we will close off by giving just a little bit of information about Creative Commons. We were asked to talk about that. Uh, we understand that licensing law itself will be covered more generally later on in the presentation. So we'll dive into the background uh, right now. So what is uh, copyright? As Alex said, it's this, it's this bundle of rights. It's really it's a system uh, of rights that let you exclude someone else from doing something. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can do something. As Alex was describing a derivative work, you take something, you add something new to an existing work already maybe. That doesn't mean that your new work, all of it, you have the right to share, copy, whatever, to the extent it incorporates something that came before it that's still copyrighted in someone else's. They still have those rights in that underlying piece. You only have your right in what you have. So it's a right to exclude. Uh, Rights granted in the public interest. Uh, I think Alex did a great job of talking about this tension in the law uh, of what happens, the constitutional basis of trying to promote the sciences and the arts. And really what that means is it's the tension. It's private rights. It's really a monopoly. And usually we don't like monopolies in the law. We have antitrust laws that are geared on keeping monopolies out. But yet we give them in... in copyright in patent law, to a certain extent in trademark law, and, and it's part of this Faustian bargain. We'll give you a limited set of rights, or as Alex was saying, maybe not so limited, uh, and in exchange for that, once those rights are done, once that time is done, it's in the public domain. It's for all of us to use and enjoy. It's part of your incentive to create whatever it is that is you made. Even still, as part of balancing this right, and as Alex had mentioned, it is, uh, fair use plays a role in this. Uh, we have this whole goal of contributing to a vibrant and full public domain. And so if the copyrights would actually lock that off and prevent us from actually 
accessing that, then that would defeat the purpose. And so fair use is, if anything, a, a relief valve. And we'll see that in a little bit. Uh, traditionally common law, it's now statutory. Uh, Alex and I can disagree about how nice the statute is. Certainly there are, are certain parts that are rough. The restaurant exemption for retransmission, I, I don't think I've ever read that through all the way because I fall asleep about halfway through and it's pages and pages long. Other parts though, it's, it's actually one of the better organized statutes if you glaze over some of the parts uh, that uh, Alex I think has some particular issues with. So you, you have your definitions and you actually can walk through from section one onward what would be a traditional copyright analysis. You have the definitions, you have all of the p items that Alex was saying of what is and is not protectable, how do you make it, how do you get it. You walk through these steps and unless you have something that's protectable, there isn't a copyright. And so if you use something that's not protectable, it's not that you made a fair use of it, you were never infringing in the first place. Um, and Alex spoke about the idea expression dichotomy, we don't need to repeat this. Alex mentioned this bundle of rights. If the thing you do isn't one of the protected rights, what you did wasn't a fair use, what you did wasn't actually infringing. So you, you don't say I did a fair use, you're never in that position. And then it's worth pointing out where we're going to spend all of our time in this presentation, immediately after they talk about those protectable bundles, the next 14 sections of the act, and actually it's a little longer because there were a few others that don't wonderfully numerically fit in this row that also apply, but there are a number of exceptions to these rights. Fair use is the first one, it's the sexy one, everyone wants it. If any of the others come up and apply for you, you want to use those, and you'll see why, and we'll get into them, and we'll talk about some of them that may be more applicable in the academic context a little bit. And then there are other parts of the act. It gets to transfer and assignment, registration, litigation, defense. We're not going to be talking about any of these, uh, but the statute certainly moves on and covers a number of things. So uh, as we mentioned, there are a number of exceptions. We'll talk about fair use. That's not where we're starting because that's also not where you should start. And uh, Jessica's going to take over on some of these exceptions. So we, we, wanna, we will get to fair use, but the first thing we want to do is look through these other exceptions to copyright um, because they are maybe a little bit easier and less murky. So the, there's several, the reproduction by libraries and archives, course use, the TEACH Act, and a handful of others. But the, the four that we've spelled out are the ones that are the most useful in the academic context. And again, we want to emphasize that Fair use is up front, but these other ones are probably where you want to turn and at least look for help first before turning to fair use. So for libraries and archives, um, you can, a library can create or distribute one copy if there's no indirect or commercial advantage, it's open to the public or researchers in a set field, or it includes a, and it includes a copyright notice. So this builds in the idea that libraries don't have to argue a fair use, they have an exception. They, as long as it hits these three requirements, you don't need to worry about anything else. You are accepted what your, your conduct is not infringing. And, and the act itself says that. It is not an infringement of copyright if, and then it goes into these exceptions. Um, yes, yeah, so we, it's, it's easier. They're perhaps narrow, but it's an easy way to not have to fight a battle in court over fair use. Um, you're allowed to keep three copies for archival purposes. Um, and it only applies to isolated and unrelated reproductions, not a systematic loaning and systematic giving, of, giving out and copying of copyrights. But you are allowed to keep one or three for archival purposes copies of copyrighted works without having to worry about whether you're going to be sued for infringement. Um, the next exception is for uh, course use, which is section 110, another exception to infringement. Uh, this is probably common for all teachers, uh, and you know that you do it all the time, so you're probably not infringing, otherwise you would have a problem. Um, classroom or instructional performance or display of a, copyright, of a copy of a work um, in a face-to-face -face interaction with a teacher standing in front of a room full of students is not going to be considered infringement. Um, it's, it's a technical reproduction of a copyrighted work, but it is not, um, it is not something that the law seeks to prevent you from doing. 
um, and it is specifically excluded. So when you show a clip, when you pull some material and put it on a slide, in, in a face-to-face -face interaction, uh, in a teaching context, you are not infringing on that work. When you, the English teacher, read a poem out to your class, there are plenty of examples in a number of fields of classroom performance or display of works. It, if, if you stole the work, the copy, you downloaded it from Napster and then played it, <laughs> you're not in this section. But if you lawfully obtain the copy you're displaying, you're under 110. Uh, and Circular 21 is a helpful tool for guiding people through this, this section and how to use it without kind of walking down into the infringement territory. Um, one thing that's important to note is that this isn't, Circular 21 is put out by the Copyright Office, but it is not law, it is not binding. It's a set of guidelines to try to help people navigate and show them you know, what would probably, if anything, when, when they're starting to toe the line and when they should stop. Uh, so, for example, works are allowed if you have one copy for an instructor for research and prep work and one copy for a classroom to use. The, like, a copy of a work is not going to be infringement if you, un, Circular 21 says that, so it's a good guideline that if you have one copy for your work, for your research and preparation, and another copy to distribute to your, to your class, one per person, that is not going to probably offend the copyright law. Um, the, there are requirements for this, however. You can, they, the three of them are brevity, spontaneity, and non-cumulative. This can't, you can't use this exception uh, 110 to kind of, as an end around to getting a textbook for your class. You can't have class session one be chapter one of this biology textbook and class session two be chapter two and just break it up into pieces, you will need to get a textbook and pay for that. Yes? Is there a quick question? Sure. sure. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of questions. The first is to, you know, to highlight the face-to-face -face teaching. Mm -hmm. I like to hear your opinion about the online teaching platform. Mm -hmm. That is actually exactly. Uh, to your first question, that is the very next topic. Uh, the, the second question, I, I believe, is a bit hairier um, because it's harder to control. It is something that you want to have one per person. Um, hard copies would be a better bet because you can control that. Uh, th this is part of one of the points that Alex was saying is we are now trying to interpret a 1970s era law in light of new technology. Certainly there have been interpretations in light of I mean, this is the act we have and people have been rolling forward. If there are ways of really you have a single copy for only the pupils and it is face to face, it's not exactly clear what it means if you're distributing it electronically to your, maybe in a couple more years when you and your students are all in some sort of local hosted something and you can just push just to them, just for the class, maybe you'd be closer to this. You, you would see, and we're gonna talk about the TEACH Act a little more, which was an attempt to try and address some of these in some ways, perhaps not as clearly as they could have. Uh, so it's 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 an interesting, certainly an interesting question. Can I tell you? Yeah. Library, library stuff. Sure. Well, that, that would be a situation where your library either has set up a, someone has paid for the access to that. So it's either your library's bought a, a subscription or has an agreement with another library who's bought a subscription. And I, I can't be certain, but I'm sure there's a cap or there's some sort of a structure for avoiding unlimited requests of those uh, journal articles or anything of that nature. But it, it is not as though you tricked the system. Just some, somehow the money doesn't come out of your pocket, but someone is still paying the royalty for it and it's still um, being licensed. And that may be part of uh, another license. Yeah, it, it, 
in all likelihood, yes. The, 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 the different repositories, and, and you see this e even in the legal context, you have um, uh, relationships for uh, all of the cases that come out. You have those big publishers, Westlaw and Lexis, and technically you need to have subscriptions and pay them money to access. They have relationships, and actually they try to get people hooked on it. You know, your first shot is free, and then your, your next pill costs you more. So they actually have uh, relationships with all law schools to have free access to students. So there are different ways the different uh, providers of content have structured access, different ways that universities or other institutions have arranged to get access for individuals. It, it, it's not necessarily because it's an exception or end run around the copyright, but it, it, it may be to, to the student or the, the faculty member that's using it, they may not know exactly why they're able to go to the library and get a particular copy. You'll see when we get to you know, go to the library and then make a copy. Sometimes things become hairier even still. <laughs> and we, we actually have a few examples of that. <laughs> uh, so just to circle back to circle, Circular 21, uh, the, the requirements basically are just that the brevity requirement, it shows that you can't just take wholesale amounts of work and it has certain guidelines as to percentages and numbers and things like that. The spontaneity means you, you're really not supposed to plan a whole course around getting unlicensed copyright works. And non-cumulative, you can't just wa walk through a whole textbook uh, week by week without buying the textbook. Um, Oh, you, the oh bottom sorry, right. right button. Sorry about go. that. Um, and so again, it's not a substitution or a replacement. It's just supposed to be if you are supplementing your class and with a really great example or poem or something like that. And uh, at, at, actually, we have printout copies of this that if oh. we had been thinking a little earlier, we would have passed out. Yes. So they're available at the the back, and uh, I, it may be possible that someone can come around and hand a couple of these out to help you follow <laughs> along at home. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so the TEACH Act is another is the second part of Section one uh, one ten, and this is a was an adaptation, an exemption to en enable distance learning, which has become it, it is an attempt to modernize the copyright statute because in recent probably a decade and a half it has become such a huge thing. Um, so this is intended. The TEACH Act is intended to allow the same principles of face-to-face -face instruction and education to happen over the internet but still stay within the the scope of an, ex an exception to an infringement so you're not it's not allowed to just do anything you want because it's now online but we are trying to bring the copyright act into the modern age and the the distance difference and the what they call asynch asynchronous ed education is is key because a lot of students are taking courses at their own pace um, and a lot of the even even new courses you just come in and you use the materials as you can and that was a challenge under the the law previously uh, so this slide is more useful now that you have hard copies of everything uh, it's just the text of the act and I've highlighted some of the or I've bolded some of the uh, sections that are a little more important and show more of the the actual requirements you need to be using these materials as but at the at the behest of an instructor you have to be a pupil this these are for educational purposes so the the text really just shows that it's it is a narrow exception but it is something that is happening happening increasingly in the educational context so they felt the need to incorporate it uh, so the key results of these amendments were to facilitate the growth and development of digital distance education. So really embrace this and try to iron out some of these areas where the law just really wasn't adapted to electronical mediums of teaching. Um, it accommodates new, uh, new technologies by expanding the, the types of transmissions and the ways that, uh, that the exception, what the exception covers. Um, and it really, it was an attempt to recalibrate the policy of, we, as we were saying before, you want people to be able to disseminate and use copyrighted works, but you do still want to give the person who came up with the work, who put the work into it, the, the right to exclude or the right to receive royalties and stuff like that. So you're, they're trying to re-strike that balance. Um, 
But the language is limiting. It is not a huge exception. You have to use reasonable and limited portions of copyright works. The, the courses are not intended to just give, give out textbooks for free. You still need to ob obtain licenses and pay royalties in many situations. Um, this exception is only available to government bodies or accredited nonprofit educational institutions. So it's not, not everything applies. You have to fall into those defined terms. Um, you have to only send things to students. You can't just post things online. You have to have a student enrolled in a class um, and who is getting these materials at the behest of an instructor. Um, and the materials need to be for educational purposes. It has to be a, it, it still has to be a classroom context. The original spirit of it was a face-to-face -face interaction. And this is just trying to address a different kind of interaction, but it's still using the materials the same way. And there's an added additional wrinkle uh, in trying to strike this new balance. They were saying, look, if the thing that you're trying to use, the reason it was written was to actually be sold to people who were going to be streaming uh, uh, classes and, and uh, things. So they're, they're actually companies that provide uh, course book and uh, lesson plans and materials you can pass out. Their entire market is squarely within what this exception is covering. There's actually a carve out for those things, the material where the primary market is mediated instructional activity so that they are not in this exception. The, the notion being trying to strike that balance of encouraging the people to create the works that you want to be used. You want people to be able to figure out great ways to do distance learning, be able to write things that are meant for distance learning, and then to not have that be swallowed by an exception that says you can use it all for free for distance learning. So that is <laughs> part, part of this and can go back to some of the themes that were looked at in the circular, uh, which again is not binding, was the kind of, you know, it's spontaneous. Gee, it would be helpful if in this class I can share this poem this uh, song is really, uh, th this was the song the artist was listening to when they wrote the book, and let's try and figure out what, like, to, to, to try and take it to that next level, not to take the place of the, <laughs> the works that are meant to be actually used in the course itself. Yeah, it, it's supposed to be allowing for a rich educational experience uh, that you don't have to be rigidly stuck to a textbook that you bought. You can bring in other material, but you're not really supposed to create your course around it. Uh, and the, the final limitation on it is that you have to have some means to ensure that these, that you're not just emailing out a PDF to all your students. You have to have some kind of technological barrier to keep these things from just being disseminated out to everyone once you've given it to someone. So it requires that you, you show that you've done that. Um, and moving on. Yeah. That's right. Correct. Yeah, it, it, it is only for nonprofits. The uh, earlier section 110 is also for nonprofits. Uh, the TEACH Act has the accreditation requirement that was added in, undefined accreditation requirement, actually. But uh, that, that goes to some of Alex's points of understanding the statute. So, uh, copyright fair use. This is the one, th th this was the title, this is why you all came. Let's talk about it. So, first, what is it? Everyone says my use is a fair use. It's not really the, the proper technical way to say it, because copyright fair use is a defense. Somebody comes up to you and says, you're using my work. My work is copyrighted. Your use is one of those particular uh, bundle of rights that I have exclusively. You are infringing my copyrights. And this is when you say, yes, but mine is a fair use. That's where it's brought up. It's, an, it's a defense to infringement. It's not a permission. It's not a limited dictation of the scope of copyright, it is a defense. And not only is it a defense, it's an affirmative defense. If there is great case law out there that would say what you were doing is, you know, already been determined 20 different times, 20 different ways to have been a fair use, but when you're sued about it, you don't bring it up, it doesn't help you. Affirmative defense is one you have to raise yourself. So what this means, it's argued post-infringement. It's your burden to raise it and it's your burden to prove it. If the best you can do is say, I'm about equal, as an affirmative defense, you've lost. So uh, 
as, as Alex was saying, it could be a bit murky. There's a reason for it. It's a fact-dependent analysis it, based on a number of factors, and SCOTUS, very helpfully, is determined case by case. It is not to be simplified with the bright line rules. Not that we just haven't gotten to, not that the next time Congress updates the statute we expect them to. The Supreme Court says that this is the kind of thing that there should not be bright line rules about. You should take a look at the particular use, weigh all the factors, and determine in this context, should this be a fair use or is this really not a fair use? Is this helping us draw and strike that balance or is this usurping the particular piece that this author was hoping to reap from this and so discouraging the creation of the original works themselves, the reason we have the copyright. So there are four traditional copy, uh, statutory factors that you look at for fair use. The first is why are you using it? What is the purpose you're putting it to? So there are some things that we can think about. Are you criticizing, commenting? Are you providing news reporting? Teaching, and then this was, we looked at uh, some of the things in, in the circular as uh, uh, attempt to formalize some of what had begun as court-based exceptions. Uh, are you doing scholarship and research? Are, are you, are, what, what are you doing with it? And is it the kind of thing we, we want you to do? Are you taking it in a new and interesting direction, or are you just repeating the work? W what are you doing with it is the first of the factors. The second is the nature of the copyrighted work. As Alex mentioned, the phone book has very thin copyright protection. You can copy a whole lot more from the phone book than you can from uh, Harry Potter because what's really there is farther from the core of copyright, the expressive thing that we're trying to protect here. Uh, the next is the amount of work that you used. How much did you take? Did you take only what you needed for that purpose? Did you just photocopy the entire book and hand it out, charging people money for it? How much did you use? And the last is the effect on the marketer value for the work. And it's, it's helpful to draw this back to the purpose point. If the purpose is criticism, somebody comes out with a new book and you quote from it and utterly pan it, yes, that is an effect on the market. It might destroy the market for the book. That's not the kind of cognizable harm they're looking at, though, for this step. It's the, the market that the author had themselves for the work itself. If what you've done is you've criticized and commented, you've shown it to be totally lampoonable, and that is what's uh, limited the value. That is not cognizable harm for this particular factor. Uh, <laughs> there has actually been interesting development in case law. Up until a couple of years ago, we would have said a key thing you would try and ask when you look at all these factors is, was your use transformative? Did you, you just supersede the original work, or did you take it in this new direction? You, you, uh, you took it with a further purpose, a different character. You altered it with new expression or message. This had been uh, some circuit courts that had been following this pretty religiously, and it, it was long enough that they've been doing this that district courts started really looking at transformative use. And then we got to uh, another circuit who said, that's wrong. You should look at the statutory factors, and this transformative use is just attempting to take the place of weighing and balancing these statutory factors. So maybe this is still a key. This is now a split in the circuits, and we will have to see. So fair use, some things to think about for this. Don't jump to it. Please don't jump to fair use. If you take nothing else from this presentation, take from the first thing you say is not it's a fair use. What you say is, was it protectable or not at all in the first place? The idea expression dichotomy, is it already in the public domain? If it's in the public domain, yeah, you might have copied it, but they didn't have those rights to it anymore. Is the thing you did not in those bundle of rights? If it's not, then it's not an infringement of the copyright. Maybe you're problematic for something else, but it's not a copyright issue, so it's not that yours was a fair use. Yours was a use that they couldn't have stopped in the first place. So don't jump to fair use. And again, there are 15 other exceptions. Go to those if they can help you, because it actually says in the statute, you are not infringing if you do X, Y, and Z, and you are you know, W, X, Y. You don't need to argue fair use then. And fair use, remember, is a factored, fact-specific analysis that you raise only after you've been found to be infringing much harder to figure out. So for the gentleman in the back, be very careful if your business plan relies on fair use because fair use is not going to prevent litigation about your business plan. It's fact specific and factored. As Alex was saying, it's very difficult for us to tell you is it or is it not a fair use. It will depend on exactly the specific facts of your case and it's going to be 
you will see as we get to this sometimes where different courts have looked at very similar facts and came out different ways on a fair use analysis. And also, remember, your defense can fail. It's an affirmative defense. It could always fail. And if it does, then you have copied someone's original work of authorship. The other word for that is infringement, and there are damages for that. So, uh, it. So there, there's an example we'll get to to, to, get to flesh that out. And after that example, if you'd like, we can talk a little bit more after that, maybe after the presentation for specifics on that. Um, one point, there is no cutting edge exception to copyright law. This maybe is part of the issue that Alex was mentioning. We are trying to graft backwards some situations that have not been uh, uh, <laughs> working quite as well uh, in modern time. So huh, back to the A team. Why, why we had the A-team in the first place? Well, this is the text from that introduction. Let's replace a couple of words. And now let's walk through our analysis of what we were just saying. If you have a problem, so if the thing you're copying is not protectable, fair use is not what you're arguing. If what you did was not one of those protectable bundle of rights, we're not arguing fair use. You weren't infringing the copyrights. If no one else can help you, remember there are other exceptions to the bundle of rights. If any of those else can help you, you don't want to argue fair use. This one's the affirmative defense you have to raise after you've already been found infringing, can fail. It's factored analysis case by case. If you have a statutory exception, check the box and move on. And if you can find them, remember, it's an affirmative defense. You have to raise it, and you have to prove it. This part up here isn't really as helpful, but again, remember, A-team is just awesome. So it's all up there then maybe you have a fair use. And remember, it is not to be simplified with, fact, with bright line rules. Not that they haven't. It's not meant to be. So let's, let's do some examples. So UMG Recordings v. mp3.com. This is an early music streaming situation. What their business model was, was they would go buy a CD, copy the songs off of it, put that, put that in their database, and a user could come in, get an account with them, log in, and they'd download a little driver to their computer, and it would say, put in your CDs that you have. You'd put in your CD of that music, spin it up. It would check that you actually do own the CD. And after that, then any place you have a website accessing can access mp3.com, you can stream the songs from that CD that you had to prove that you owned. So that was their business model. Sure enough, all of the record companies sued them. <laughs> and uh, they, they argued theirs was a fair use. So let's, uh, let's look at the factors. What was the purpose of their use. Theirs was clearly to make money. They weren't charging users. They were selling ads, but they were using it for a commercial purpose. Uh, these underlying works, these musical songs, uh, what's the nature of this work? These are close to the very core of copyright. It's hard to think of a more creative or expressive thing than a piece of music. And uh, the amount that was copied, it was the whole song, not just the whole song, the whole album. And they had that in their, their database they were, they were using it on. And so, the last piece, the effect on the marketplace. This uh, was actually found to usurp the marketplace for the copyright holders themselves to be able to stream music, license people to stream music. It was found to have destroyed the market for this potential valuable use to the uh, copyright holders. So all four of the factors says this was not a fair use. So it's no surprise at all that this was not found to be a fair use. They were found to be infringing. And uh, mp3.com. The website is still around, but it's actually used by a completely different company. That company no longer exists. So our next example um, is Leibowitz v. Paramount Pictures, which uh, was about a very, very famous Vanity Fair cover, taken uh, a photo of Demi Moore taken by Annie Leibowitz. Uh, and it was, at the time, and for a very long time, possibly still, uh, the most sold cover of Vanity Fair ever. It created a big splash. Everyone was talking about it. Um, and so because it got so much attention, there was 
a way to use that for other marketing. So the Naked Gun, which was coming out in the months after uh, this, this cover hit, decided to make a uh, movie poster, and this is what it was. And that certainly would, I would remember that the, co the movie was coming that March. Uh, so, of course, Annie Leibovitz or Vanity Fair, uh, no, it was Annie Leibovitz, uh, sued. And uh, they came to a uh, fair use question. So they had to analyze the, the factors, and we will walk through all of them. But as Alex spoke about in his uh, presentation, and we only briefly touched on, there's only so much uh, that is copyrightable uh, in any piece of work. So a photo is copyrightable, but the actual human being isn't. The, the lighting, the uh, pose, perhaps, the garments, should you choose to wear them? The, those sorts of things are copyrightable, but they, the whole thing um, itself, you, you can have to break down the elements and see what it, where the actual protection is. So for one example, the pose of a pregnant woman covering her breasts, standing naked somewhere, is not necessarily uh, copyrightable because it has been in the public domain for years. A uh, photo such as this is very, very old, and so you cannot say that Annie Leibovitz has any sort of true ownership or property right over the pose that was struck. Um, so there are other aspects, the lighting, things like that, that are, that are copyrightable expression, but the, whole, the thing as a whole is not. So they came to argue fair use. Well, no, so that as, as a whole, you could yes. have copyrights in that picture. That picture was copyright protectable. And that's why we actually get into the analysis of fair use, because you actually do have a valid copyright yes. in certain of the, uh, the protectable aspects of that picture. Not everything in that picture is necessarily protectable, like the pose. But uh, certainly yeah, there are the, valid. The work as a whole, yes. My apologies. The, um, but you, you have to strip away when you're doing a fair use analysis. You cannot just give claim to something like the pose. You, you don't own that. Uh, so was it fair use? The court works through the... Uh, the factors, the first of which uh, is the purpose, which they found humorous and, and, and commentary. It was a parody, as anyone would use that term. Um, if you have keep up with any of the Kardashians, you will see that it is a very big trend to have these sorts of posed pictures now. So it is... Uh, you're, you're not, you weren't saying the Kardashians themselves are just a parody? Well, <laughs> I wasn't not saying that. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, but so this, this was a commercial use. It was used to promote a movie, but it also had the, a layer of humorousness. It had a layer of commentary um, about the pretentiousness of this pose being struck and, and all the haughtiness of it, and then just putting Leslie Nielsen's face on in this, instead. It, was, it causes a chuckle. So um, you... Uh, so then the nature of it, it was moderately protectable. As we've discussed, it, it, isn't, it isn't quite at the core like, uh, like a song or something like that, but there is expression and there, is, there are artistic choices made uh, that, that do warrant copyright protection. Um, the amount of the work that's, uh, that was copied, this is a frequent kind of dance that is done when a, when a photo or a or piece of artwork is copied because it's hard to not copy the whole thing. But most of this was, uh, was copied and it was apparently many, more than one model was sought to really find a way to make it as close to possible. So you could have conjured up the original without getting quite as close to it as they did, but they, you do still have to copy enough to bring the original to people's mind. Um, and the effect on the original work was limited. It's not as though a picture, a, a movie poster promoting the naked gun is really going to have a tremendous effect on the sales of Vanity Fair magazine. Uh, so yeah, the what you wanted was that Leibowitz picture. Is this? Yes. The, it's Leslie not Nielsen truly a replacement really for the other. Um, and the court, and so these are the four statutory factors, but court, courts often talk about the transformative use and the court found this to be a highly transformative use it it really said something different than the Vanity Fair cover it had its own voice it was a transformation of that uh, of that picture um, and this case is very useful for the the effect uh, 
factor because the problem is not the the cognizable harm is not that you are poking fun at something it, that you um, have taken something <laughs> artistic and twisted it into something perhaps grotesque the the effect is whether the the market for that original picture was or work in general was harmed and here that is not what happened so Overall, they found it to be a fair use, and the posters could live on. So, um, and we'll, I, I, actually, just a question for our host, just because I, I know we started about 15 minutes. Uh, uh, I think we started around uh, noon. So, when would you like us to end? Should we end at uh, 12:45, or should we go for an hour? Or? Okay. All right. So we'll we'll pick the pace up just a little bit then. Um, so. Uh, show of hands of folks who've taken the SATs. Everyone. The Seinfeld aptitude test? No, not, not so much. So this is uh, 600 or so trivia questions, uh, hundreds of questions of spectacular levels of detail about the television's greatest show about nothing at all. So what happened here was uh, uh, some fans wrote a, a set of questions about Seinfeld. What happened in a particular episode? Was such and such uh, character's date sponge-worthy? Uh, who was the soup Nazi, and, and what, like, very particular questions, and uh, so sold them, packaged them in, the, in this book. Uh, the, uh, the folks who ran Seinfeld were not at all happy with this particular use. Uh, they actually had been hoping to do their own uh, work like this, and so they sued to try and shut it down. And uh, so one interesting thing, I think, before we dive into this, Alex said, I heard him himself say it, facts are not copyright protectable. Yes, this is, this, uh, so you, a, a, a fact, if Jerry Seinfeld himself, the actor, breaks his arm filming, that is a fact, and that would not be protected by copyright. If Jerry Seinfeld's character in the show breaks his arm, that is actually part of the expression itself. It's called a fict, a fictional fact, part of the world. Harry Potter does have a scar on his face. That doesn't mean the fact that Harry Potter has a scar on his face is a, a fact that would exist without that expression. So... A fictional fact, so there, there was protection to it. So looking at the, the analysis, the, the purpose of this, what were they doing with selling this book? They, they were selling the book. It was a commercial purpose. Uh, you look at the nature. Uh, show of hands of people who do not think Seinfeld was an expressive work. Okay. Uh, how, how much did they take? 600 some odd questions and the level of detail they took, they actually used quotes, they used a whole bunch of people, some images, they took far more than if they had only been commenting or doing something in a transformative nature. And the effect on the marketplace, remember one of the reasons they brought the suit is because they had been working on their own version of trivia they were hoping to sell to legions of Seinfeld fans. This actually was taking the place of what it would have been one of their own derivative works. So uh, they, these were mostly not, uh, not good uh, facts for the analysis. It was found to be repackaging the original, not transforming it, and so it was not itself a fair use. Okay, so. So while Nate cues this up, this is, uh, the, the video clips will speak for themselves, but the first clip sued the second, basically. All right, hang on. That was the original work, uh, a YouTube sensation. And this is the. How are we supposed to make money on the internet? Well, how do other people make money on the internet? We have to put something up on the internet that everyone would find fascinating. Wait, I've got it.
<laughs> we apologize to people with delicate sensitivities. I uh, maybe should have warned you that this presentation would contain that. But so the original work was the uh, YouTube video, and the uh, work that got sued over was Butters' interpretation. Um, the character is named Butters for those who don't know. Um, so there was infringement was found, and we arrived at a fair use um, analysis. So the uh, the first factor, the purpose, we would the. I would, and the court did, call it a classic parody. It is. Um, it was clear that this was poking fun at and uh, kind of repurposing for humor. This video, um, the nature of the work, it is. It was an expressive work: song, dance, <laughs> video, costumes, all pretty of pretty original. It was yes, and very <laughs> original. So the court uh, found it to be at the core of copyright, um, which just means that they are very highly protected, Every uh, like most of the work is very protected. Um, and the amount of the work taken, though this is a little interesting because it contrasts with other cases, is that they took the minimum needed to comment on the, um, on the original. So says the court. You could agree yes. or disagree with that analysis. The court said this, you needed all of that to make that comment. Yes, so you'll see. It looks to me like they took a lot, but apparently the court believed that it was the minimum uh, needed to comment, and that is the par parody standard that you, because you, you need to evoke the original, um, and the uh, so the effect what on the uh, on the market for the original the court found was limited or none. Um, this isn't a, a really important factor in parody because they they're usually not trying to affect the market of the original. And uh, the court found that there was really no, if you wanted to see the original video, you still, this video did not replace it. Um, so they did, uh, they did find, oh, and this was also highly transformative, which is, again, not one of the statutory factors, but often very influential. Uh, so the court did find it fair use. This is a very good example of the unwritten rule that if the judge finds what you did funny, it's probably going to be a fair use. Um, so I, I don't think the South Fork guys have ever lost a fair use case. Yes. I don't think John Stewart has ever lost a, a fair use case. It's so. uh, <laughs> it's it's not in the statute yet. Maybe when they update it, they'll they'll add that. <laughs> <laughs> the chuckle. I, I don't know. Um, so. Uh, well, so that 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 goes to. Potentially the, the the same point that's not a cognizable harm or, or benefit. You, uh, I, what what I did is the kind of thing that people should really want to happen because people would want the original more. Uh, if the thing you did takes the place of it, then that's not going to help your your analysis. If what you've done is commented and said it's this is a great thing, that helps it. But again, what you did was commentary. It was a different purpose, so it wasn't part of that. So um, this. <laughs> This case is the example that, that Alex actually has already uh, run for us. So this is the one with uh, the little thumbnails taken from the search. Uh, so this was ditto.com. Uh, they took little thumbnails. So we can just walk through this really quickly because it's already there. It was commercial, but not highly exploitative purpose. They were making money by running this website. Uh, the underlying pictures were very creative. Uh, they were published. They were protected to the extent the photograph can be. Uh, they copied the whole image, uh, but for what they were doing, you had to copy the whole image. Just a very small piece of it's not really a helpful thumbnail search necessarily. The effect on the market of a very low degraded quality uh, image was said to be no harm to the actual market for the full artistic work. Uh, they said this was a different function, very transformative, and they found this to be a fair use. So to the gentleman in the back, we were commenting earlier you know, for uh, you know, take, take a second if your business model relies on fair use. It's not going to prevent litigation. It's not going to stop bad things from happening. But this is a case. Th this is an example of someone who rolled the dice, and it worked. They did it. Their use was found to be a fair use, even though their business model depended on it. So great. They're, they're home free. And can I get a show of hands of how many people did a ditto.com image search in the last year? It, is everyone asleep? No one's hands are, are up. I actually tried yesterday. Company is no longer even in business. Uh, that it's now a website for sunglasses and eyeglasses. Uh, so probably the reason is because of these guys. One of the other little thorns of a fair use uh, for your business plan is that's 
if you could do it, someone else can do it. Someone else giant can do it and blow you utterly and completely out of the water. Actually, Google's use, even though the, uh, the underlying use uh, had, had that pretty much exactly the same situation had been in a court case, Google still got sued over it. And so it was, again, a factored analysis went through. I guess the final salt in the wound for Ditto.com is their case was cited as helpful but in no way dispositive to Google's use. They ran through the factors again themselves and came to the similar determination that Google's use was also a fair use. And then Google proceeded to blow Ditto.com out of the water. Um, so we're running low on time, so I think yeah. we should. So we have another example, but this is just going through the factors again. You can see the two works next to each other, and it's in your slides. Okay. Um, you one thing, want to go pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing we want to emphasize is that academic use is not fair use. Just because you are using it in an educational way does not mean it, you feel like it's benefiting society or any or you're not using it commercially or anything like that. It is not. It does not mean you are out from under having to get a license or pay royalties. Um, so this is why textbooks and royalty payments and anything like that are still a thing. So you all already know that academic use does not automatically get you out from under uh, infringement. And it's not, a, not automatically a fair use. Uh, research is the same kind of animal. It just, um, you, have, you have to pay for, just like you have to pay for all those journal articles, research is another reason, is another thing that is not automatically fair use. Um, the one bit of this that people often bump into is that people will approach the author of something asking for their permission to do something, and an author will say yes. But an author is often not the owner of the cop copyright. So authors have an interest in disseminating their work. They'll say yes to everyone because they want their work out there, and they're not getting paid anyway. But the publisher will say no and make you get a license. So just. Just little caveats, I suppose. We should uh, run through these really quick. And then, so this is a, in, these are more in an academic uh, setting, and but another fair use um, case. Uh, this is an example of a another person who built his business on fair use. He was a print shop that uh, put together course packs, but decided to skip the piece where he went and got licenses for everything. So his course packs were cheaper than everyone else's, um, and he believed he had conducted his own fair use analysis, and his use was a fair use. So. That's what that is. The use was commercial. He was selling the course packs. It was not educational just because they were course packs. His use was commercial. Um, the nature of the works were creative and expressive. These were textbooks and things like that. Um, the amount that was copied was, um, they were pieces. They weren't textbooks wholesale, but the smallest bit, bit was uh, more than 8,000 words. They were major chunks of things copied. They differed you know, across different works, but he was copying significant amounts of work. Which makes sense, because this is why the teacher chose this part of the book yes. to copy, because yeah. this was important, the important part. Yeah, important parts, <laughs> large parts. Um, and, and the effect would be, uh, would have devastated the market if everyone just stopped getting licenses, then people would really not, not write textbooks anymore uh, because they would not be, there would be no market for it. And this was not transformative. This was photocopying and maybe repackaging um, in different compilations, but he was not transforming things. So it's not a good business model and it was not fair use, so he lost that case. So that was the guy who decided he himself was going to photocopy the course packets. Sure enough, as soon as that case came down, another person decided to try and found their business model on fair use, and this is what they were going to do. Same basic facts, only what happens was the professors themselves are the ones that make the master copy. They'll take it to the particular copy center. The copy center will have that master copy on file. A student will walk in, show their ID, sign a piece of paper, yes, I'm a student in so-and-so's course. And the student will get the master copy. The student will walk that over to the copy machine sitting right there and push start themselves. So the student themselves is pushing start on the copy. And so did that change the analysis? Yeah, not so much. The purpose, the purpose for this copy center was still commercial. The analysis was not what the student was using it for. The analysis was the copy center. This was the person who was being sued. The nature of the works, again, creative. The amount, exactly the same. The effect, again, it had the same effect. The court even went so far as to say, look, the exact same facts should not hinge on which of two people pushes the copy button. It's the exact same analysis. Not transformative, same use. It is not a fair use. So, and we really need to fly for some of these. <laughs> so this is another situation with uh, a minor difference is that there, 
now pieces of uh, of courses are being posted online in a in a kind of regimented segment that only students of the class can can find, can get at access to it. And this was posted the, by the university's library yes, itself, right? Yes, the GSU was post was was posting it was allowing. Um, the students access uh, and so the court did find that it was a not a nonprofit educational use not a commercial use they, there was no one making money off of any of this the nature was uh, non transformative it was that the nature of the underlying works were expressive and nothing was being transformed by them by the posting of them the um, the amount that was being posted was in the aggregate a limited amount but again there were snippets of different things some of which were large chunks that went to the heart of things, other bits were smaller, and the court did not analyze each individual excerpt, uh, but in the aggregate it found that a limited amount of copying was happening, um, and that, they, that the effect was that there was, that there was no direct evidence of a market being affected by this, a, 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 an efficient market for licensing in this way, so that it, it, it would indicate that it doesn't exist because there is no direct evidence of it. And this is a helpful example of different courts coming to different conclusions because you saw in just the last two cases courts saying, look, there is a market for licensing these pieces for course packets. Often it's a high fee because the companies want you to actually buy the whole book instead. But the, the court in that instance found that there had been a market and you actually were harming it by having this course packet more freely available. This is a very similar situation. This is, again, a course packet for use in courses, and they found in this instance very similar facts, except a different entity was the one that was doing it. It was, was there. Maybe a slightly less was used. It said this didn't have an effect on the market because there wasn't really a robust market for these licenses. Yes. So they called it a fair use, and, and the, it's just an example of the fact-specific, the court-specific, the kind of squishy, hairy nature of this analysis, and why you'd like to avoid it if you could. So... Um, I think we'll go ahead and skip this next one. And you think this one's worth covering, just very briefly? Sure. Uh, this is uh, a, a student who was uh, working on his dissertation and had some issues with the university and submitted a, a draft of his dissertation to the university uh, in, in the course of trying to figure out the other issues he was having with them. And they posted it to and archived it on, uh, electronically. Um, in their library. In their library, and they and he could not get them to remove it, and so he sued, saying that that having posted it was infringement. Um, the court found this to be a non-commercial educational use. Uh, the nature of the work was unpublished, which affords you less copyright rights because the copyright law wants you to publish things and put them out there for the world. So if you're keeping them close to your chest, you're not going to get as well. No, that. The, the nature of the work being unpublished actually sometimes gives more right. The ability to control the first instance into commerce is seen as a valuable right to the author. So the fact yeah. that it was unpublished and being distributed actually was viewed as weighing in his favor. Um, the amount of the work was the entire work. They had, it was a draft form, but it was all of it. And so he, um, it was the entire thing. And the effect was, as the uh, plaintiff argued, was to completely deprive him of the value of the work. It's important to note that this was at an early stage of litigation where the court was compelled to look at everything in the favor of the plaintiff in, or, when, in making their ruling. So they, uh, he believed that he was completely deprived of the value of the work because he could not do anything with it while they had it. Uh, so he, so, and the court had to go with him on that, and so they found this to have not been a fair use. So in one of our final pieces, we'd like to ask you all a question. So we showed you a clip of the A-team at the beginning. We had a, the text of the A-team in the middle. So we'd like to ask you the question, was what we did okay? So someone want to try and venture an answer? Why? Hang on, Alex. <laughs> if no one else can help us, we go to fair use. But in our particular instance here at a nonprofit educational institution in a face-to-face -face instructional setting to students and uh, faculty of the institution, maybe we could take a look at 110 and see how we could do with that. May maybe, maybe not. There could be interpretation issues. But we, we would want to start our analysis, I think, right there before we dive into fair use. Because, again, if we can find our... Uh, ability to use it under an earlier exam, under one of those other exceptions, that's a statutory exception for copyright, and we wouldn't have to argue fair use. So um, that is uh, uh, 
one, one piece for that. So Creative Commons licensing, just an example of if you are the one who has a uh, uh, copyrighted work and what you want to do is you want to get it out there just freely and openly. You don't want to get licenses. You don't, you don't want to get royalty uh, for it. You don't want to try and control too much how it's uh, being pushed out down and later. Uh, again, you can cut, and there's an entire other presentation on licensing, so we're not going to talk in any detail about it. But as you're going to see, you can slice and dice licenses any which way. We get paid quite a lot to write licenses all day long and help people slice and dice that bundle of rights into all sorts of fine degrees. But if that's not what you want, if what you want to do is get something out, an example of a license you might be, want to look at are the Creative Commons. So this is Wikipedia is a big example of something that's licensed under the Creative Commons. And there are actually different flavors. And this chart just goes and gives a little explanation of they have a number of different versions of their license that do different things. And actually, it talks. And actually, the materials you have in front of you talk about what each of those different levers uh, mean. So we will uh, end our presentation there. We know the folks in the other room were looking at uh, uh, open source software. This actually is a, a line from an actual piece of open source software that I thought was incredible. And we'll, we'll go ahead and increment this for you. There you go. Uh, so I, I know we're at the end of our time, so I don't think we have uh, time for any additional questions. But thank you very much for coming and listening to open uh, to fair use. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you.